Thank you for tuning in once again to Gods, Demons, and Magic. This is your host, Sri Sachidanandan Das. And over the last few episodes, we've been discussing one's personal daemon, which in ancient Hellenistic Egyptian astrology or mysticism, uh, the personal daemon was really one's via medium to the gods. It's sort of like the, the gods are in such a high sphere of existence, they've empowered a particular spirit or being to come into your life as an individual and you can approach that particular being and by listening to the instructions or guidance of that being you can make spiritual elevation and by harmonizing your life with how that being is conducting your fate as seen in your astrological chart you can live in harmony with the entire cosmos and finally you can actually approach this being and ask that this daemon to relieve you of any negative fate or karma that you may have. So the personal daemon in many ways was central to one's spiritual practice as well as material well-being. Now, the personal daemon can be found in two different ways. One can approach through astrology, which as we mentioned is the process preferred by Porphyry. Uh, and there he's known as the oikodespotes, which means the master of the house. Just like if you have a, a rich man who owns a ranch and he owns all of the sheep or cattle around the ranch and the land itself and all of the people, his family working in the ranch are under his control. So the oikodespotes controls your life. He controls your chart. He pulls the puppet strings of your karma or your fate. And so really he's in charge of your destiny. Now finding the oikodespotes or the personal daemon in one's chart is a very difficult thing to do. He's the king of the chart. He manages your life and he has a central role. And so you, if you understand his position, it's sort of like unlocking the entire chart and your fate becomes clear. In the process of finding this oikodespotes, or this representative of your, of your personal daemon, is itself a spiritual practice, almost like a, a rigorous astrological practice which is meant to elevate the soul. And it was taken on with the religious significance of worship. And there's many different prominent Hellenistic astrologers. Uh, they all had different ways of calculating this oikodespotes. In general, they all sort of agreed that it's the most beneficent planet in the chart, the one that is positioned in your chart in the way that is most powerful and most kind to you. And that's a sort of general guideline, but they all have very, very complex ways of going about it. And Porphyry himself, who's actually asking the Egyptian priest Anibo in the book we're studying, uh, he's asking him, how, how do you find it? What's your opinion? Can you weigh in on this? Because there's so many different ways that people present of how to find the oikodespotes. And Porphyry himself gives his own technique in the introduction to the Tetra Biblios. He actually gives a, a technique to find it himself. So um, there's many different ways in which it, this used to be approached. And oftentimes it was understood that it cannot be understood simply through astrological means. Rather, one has to include different processes of divination, etc. But for the astrologers, this was a very, very important practice. Now, Iamblichus, the student of Porphyry, he sort of bypasses this whole complex technical process and, so, and advises one to practice theurgy or the ritualistic uh, invocation of one's personal daemon. In other words, perform a magical ritual and have the daemon just appear right before you. And so this was a, a very uh, common practice that one would try to invoke one's personal daemon through magic or through, through a kind of religious worship. And as we mentioned in the previous episode, this was actually done by Plotinus. Uh, there was an Egyptian priest visiting Rome, and at the request of others, you know, he agreed to uh, bring Plotinus to the local Egyptian temple and perform a ritual where his, uh, his personal daemon would appear before everyone. And it happened. In fact, it happened so magnificently that they were in awe because his personal daemon appeared and he wasn't just a regular daemon, he was actually a god. And, and, uh, and this incident is remembered you know, throughout time. So what was the particular ritual performed by that Egyptian priest, we don't know. But within the magical papyri, which are a compilation of uh, Egyptian, Greek, Hermetic, Jewish, Mithraic, Gnostic 
magic rituals, uh, you can find rituals that for invocation of one's personal daemon. So I'm going to talk a little bit in this particular episode. I'll give an example of how one would invoke a daemon. The ritual begins with the choosing of the best astrological moment when all the planets are in their most auspicious positions. Now this is a very, very important part of the ritual. In fact, it's central because what you're doing is you're finding a time when the, the planets themselves are going to be most readily accessible to you and most beneficently predisposed towards your request. And so you have to find a time when the planets are, in a sense, happy. And at this very pure, auspicious moment, you, you, know, you strike the hammer while the iron is hot, right? And the reverberation of that hammer then extends throughout the universe. And as that reverberation comes back to you, it'll be powerful. And especially one has to pay attention to the moon. And uh, the moon should be in a very auspicious position. This is also true in, in Vedic astrology and the science of Mahurtur, choosing the auspicious moment to begin something. Uh, in that particular science, the moon is supposed to be free of any malefic conjunction, meaning like Saturn or Mars. Uh, and also if the seventh from the moon should also be in a free of any negative influence or conjunction. And the moon is really your own mind, your own ego, and your own desires. It's, really, it's sort of like the your, your very self. And the moon is very closely connected to the daemons, just as the, the gods, in a sense, are above our strata and unreachable in many ways. Uh, and the daemon is a via medium, reflecting the light of the gods and bringing it down to our level. So similarly, you have the sun as very much the, the royalty, the, the high god of the universe. Uh, and the moon is, is very much like the daemons. It's between us and the sun, and it reflects the light of the sun in a gentle and peaceful way that we can accommodate. You know, the moonlight's very beautiful. It's very soothing. Uh, it's not very aggressive or overpowering, whereas the light of the sun can even be dangerous to your eyes. It can burn your skin. So similarly, the daemon, he's very soothing. He brings down the light of the gods uh, to you in a way which is palatable and approachable and, and one, in many ways human. But above all the planets, the sun should also be in an auspicious position. Uh, the sun is the king. And if you think about it, you know, if, if you have the king in a very happy mood, free of any negative influences, then he's very charitable. He's very beneficent. It's just like if you go to see the king, you know, and if the king has just had an argument with his wife and somebody just stole from him, he can't find his crown. Or, you know, there's so many things that can be going wrong. You know, someone's threatening a war on his borders. And you go before him and you ask him for a benediction. He'll probably just say, you know, just, I'm sorry, but you, you have to get out of here. You know, I don't have time. Or, you know, I'll just, I, he might not even speak to you. He'll just ask one of his assistants to tell you that now is not the time. You know, so you really want the son to be in a happy position. Uh, traditionally, you'll see like a father is supposed to be very charitable at the uh, the wedding of his daughter. You know, so if like you have the king has just married over his, away his daughter, and he's sort of like drunk with emotion and happiness and joy, then if you approach the king at that moment, he'll give you whatever you want practically. And similarly, any planets that are associated with the sun uh, that are around him are considered like his personal guard or you might say, uh, the royal court. So if, if those planets that are around him, such as Jupiter, Mercury and Venus or Mars, whoever's there, if they're also nicely situated, then it becomes very auspicious. It's like the entire court is in a joyful mood. You know, imagine if there's a great cause for celebration and you walk into the royal court and everyone's congratulating you and welcoming you. That's a good time to speak to the sun. It's a good time to speak to the king. And so the sun, in many ways, is the king of all the planets. Um, and so when invoking one's daemon, what this particular ritual is advising one to do is to approach the sun god and to essentially please the sun god with prayers and with uh, rituals of purity or purification. And because the sun is, is the, the god of the universe in many ways or the god of the, the material cosmos, and the creator of all the other planets, he is also in charge of the daemons. The daemons rise up from the human platform, growing progressively higher and higher until they get to the gods, and the sun is at the top of that hierarchy. 
So in many ways, he's in control of the daemons, and he can tell them what to do, and he can arrange a meeting between you and your daemon. And he is considered the greatest of the daemons. The sun is, is also another name for the sun. It's the good daemon. And so one is praying to the greatest of daemons to make a meeting between you and your personal daemon. And in this particular ritual, the sun is supremely important. And after finding this auspicious moment, one begins by offering prayers. And so first one offers prayers to Tyche, and she's the goddess of fortune. And so you're asking her to essentially shower down, to rain down her mercy upon the ritual and to make it fortunate, to make it lucky, for lack of a better word, which in many ways is to remove any inauspiciousness and create an atmosphere of auspiciousness. It's by her blessing that this ritual will work. So in addition to creating this auspicious moment using astrology, you're going to then request the gods to rain down, sort of like the the, the golden rain that falls during when the sun is shining, you know, and there's a, a sun shower. You know, so similarly you want to create this sort of bountiful, joyous blessing of, of the goddess of fortune onto the ritual. And so you offer obeisances or prayers to her. And then next you offer obeisances to the daemon, which is predominating that particular place and that particular hour, that particular day. As we mentioned in previous episodes in Egyptian astrology, there was the 36 constellations or dakins, and each of these dakins was associated with a particular daemon. So you might say all the different wheels of time which are moving and combining to create that particular moment, there's daemons which preside over these different hours and moments and days, as well as the very place you're performing the ritual. And so you're going to offer obeisances to these daemons, who should also be auspicious, that's part of the timing, and, uh, and essentially receiving their blessings to perform this ritual. And next one offers prayers to the earth and heavens. You're essentially calling the entire universe of which you're a part, and which is essentially personal. The universe is not simply dead matter or, you know, atoms and molecules. Uh, the universe is, is thriving, it's alive, it's every aspect, every movement, everything is conducted by the gods and the daemons and spirits. And so you're creating auspiciousness by praying essentially to the very situation universally in which you find yourself. You'll see this, in, for example, within the, the Vedic tradition, before one begins a sacrifice, there's a ritual of imprinting the universe, it's called a sankalpa, and holding water into one's hand, and one chants into this water, uh, Sanskrit mantras in which you are declaring the ritual you're performing and you're declaring who it's being performed for, uh, who it's being performed by, and you're, you're also mentioning the time at which it's performed and the places which it's performed. And then after doing this into the water, then you release the water. And so this particular ritual, it's to be imprinting the universe with the sacrifice you're about to perform. It's kind of like setting the time, putting your stamp on the universe. And uh, and in many other rituals, you'll see this, this tradition of, of calling the directions or calling the sun and the moon as a witness. There's the idea of sort of like summoning the directions themselves and uh, sanctifying the time and the place uh, that you're performing the ritual. And uh, I would say like in, an, in, in a larger sense, you're calling the attention of the cosmos onto yourself. And your, your stance towards the cosmos is one of reverence and respect and humility. And in many ways you're saying, you know, I'm here, I'm about to perform ritual, please pay attention and please give your blessings. And so after this begins the prayers to the sun. It begins, you know, Hail Sun, for you are the one who has set yourself over the holy firmament with an unseen light. The unseen light meaning when the sun is setting, it's in the Egyptian cosmology, it passes into the underworld, into the realm of Osiris, and passes through the darkness and chaos to reemerge again, reborn. So the sun is, is always shining when when it's left our particular sky, it enters into the underworld, and it's daytime there. 
And so in this particular ritual, there's many different prayers to the sun, acknowledging essentially his power over the cosmos, his lord, his lordship over all the aspects of creation, which actually come from himself, even the other planets, which are so important in conducting the fate of the living beings. They all come from him. And so ultimately, he has the power to arrange your fate. He's in control of it all. And he's addressed as the master of the whole. Everything is in his power. He's addressed as the holy scarab. And the scarab or dung beetle uh, is very sacred within the Egyptian traditions and symbolic of the sun. When the sun rises, he's in the mood of Kepri or the, uh, the god of creation. He's a newborn sun. He's a youthful, a young man full of vibrance and power. Having passed through the underworld, he rises victorious and full of beauty and might and youth. And as the sun passes overhead, you know, at the midheaven, uh, is considered to embody Ra, or the, the the sun god, typically as we know him, the lord of the universe, the god of all power, the father of the gods. And as the sun makes his way to the eastern horizon, he's considered to age. Now he's an old man. Now he's preparing for death. You know, the, the sun is starting to set beneath the horizon. And so at that time, he's, rep- he's in the mood of Atum, who's worshipped in Heliopolis. And a tomb is, is, you know, representative of many other things. But Kepri, the sun rising, is very much a god of creation, whereas Atum is in the mood of winding down creation. And both Atum and Kepri are represented by the scarab. And the Egyptian priests would pray to the sun god at these particular moments, at sunrise, when the sun is at mid-heaven directly above, and when the sun is setting. And something similar is done within the Vedic culture, what's what's called the Trisandi or the Three Sundays. And Sundays are are moments when things are sort of, one one thing is merging into another and changing. And the Three Sundays are sunrise, when the sun is at mid-heaven and when the sun is setting. And uh, at that time, those who are initiated into the Brahma Gayatri Mantra, they would sip water for purification, chant certain mantras, and face in certain directions, right, in harmony with the time and place. And, uh, and they would chant a particular mantra to the sun god. And the purpose of this mantra is to call the power of the sun god uh, into one's consciousness, to sort of illuminate and enthuse one's intelligence, and essentially to bring one into a pure state of consciousness. And the purpose of this is that uh, as one goes throughout the work of one's day, by taking a moment to pause and perform this ritual, it's sort of a constant purification of consciousness by meditation, either on the sun god or on the divine supreme god, sort of within the sun god, or who the sun god ultimately represents, and who is the source of everything, material and spiritual. And so this this meditation, which was done three times a day, it's sort of like keeping yourself in higher consciousness. And the tendency is, you know, as you go throughout the day into mundane activities, your consciousness is lowered. But then for those that are initiated into this mantra, especially in the priest class, then it's a way of keeping themselves sort of aloft in consciousness. And ultimately, the perfection of this particular mantra is that you'll become purified to the extent that you can leave all material consciousness behind. And much like the the ritual being performed for the sun god in in regards to evoking one's daemon, that particular ritual, the chanting of the Brahma Gayatri, is very much dependent upon ritual purity and uh, attention and, and doing it at the proper time. So after the prayers to the sun god, and when the sun god, again, reciting with his court in a very beneficent mood, is pleased with you, then you begin a ritual of purification. And this purification ritual involves using two male eggs. And you have to acquire ink made from myrrh, as in frankincense and myrrh, as a a kind of gummy residue from a thorny plant that was generally gotten from Yemen, Somalia, uh, and that area. And uh, and so it would have to be acquired by trade through Egypt. But you get this particular form of incense, and you could turn it into an ink. And so it's a kind of sacred ink. I wouldn't be surprised if it had some connection to the sun. Taking the sacred ink, you write on the two eggs a very specific formula in ancient Greek, a prayer. And then at sunrise, 
you go before the sun, just as it's bursting forth in all its power and glory, unconquerable from the underworld, and you begin performing a an, an ritual purification with the eggs. One of the eggs you'll take and you'll wipe it up and down your body. This is very similar to rituals that are performed to this day uh, in Santeria, for example, where the priest will take an egg and, while chanting prayers, will wipe your entire body up and down with the egg. And the egg is considered like an astral or spiritual sponge that's going to draw out any negativity that's within you into itself. Any negativity, any curses, any negative spirits, uh, or any negative sins that are lingering within you will be drawn into this egg. And then the egg is cast out and broken, and those energies are dispersed. So it's the, exactly the same thing is done here. In this ritual, which is thousands and thousands of years old, the egg is essentially wiped over yourself and all the negativity drawn within it, and then you cast away the you you actually you lick the mantra off, you lick this prayer off because the mantra is pure, and then you throw the egg away and cast it, break it, and essentially uh, scatter those energies. Then, with the unbroken hand, you raise it to the rising sun. And what you're going to try to do is draw the power, the purity of the sun into the particular egg. And simultaneously, while holding an olive branch, you then place your left hand below the elbow, uh, your right elbow, to support the egg. And you say that formula that's written on the egg, you say it seven times. And this, again, is drawing the power of the sun. And then you crack the egg, and the individual doing this ritual would swallow it. And so you do this particular ritual for seven days straight, uh, when the sun is rising and again when the sun is setting. And I assume that this ritual expects that when the sun god is pleased with you, then he will send you your personal daemon for an interview, you might say. And so the texts are very specific of, of certain things you're supposed to do when you meet your personal daemon. You're supposed to ask him questions about your destiny and your fate, and, uh, and one thing of great concern is that you're supposed to ask that daemon to relieve you of any negative fate or negative karma that may be coming to you because the daemon actually has the power to sort of forgive that fate or to release you from it. So we can imagine for these ancient magicians, this must have been an incredibly powerful experience, a, a full meeting with your own personal daemon in which your entire life and its destiny is rearranged and you've gained supernatural knowledge of, uh, of what your life means and, and how you're to live in harmony with your personal fate. And you would walk away from this experience enthused and enlightened in your practice of spiritual elevation. So thank you very much for listening. If you found value in this, please like and subscribe. If you're listening on iTunes, please visit shrisachinandana.com backslash iTunes and leave a positive review. Thank you again, and we hope that you'll join us next time on Gods, Demons, and Magic.